This podcast is brought to you by the Heldridge Hotel, New Brunswick's only four-star hotel and a preferred hotel of Rutgers football fans. The Heldridge helps you make the most of your game day weekend, providing premium accommodations in the cultural heart of downtown New Brunswick. Restaurants, bars, theaters, parks, museums, and more are only steps away. Whether you're traveling alone or with a large group, book your stay at the Heldridge and make the most of your game day weekend. Visit theheldridge.com today. Being a marketer is no sweat. You just have to manage dozens of channels, launch hundreds of campaigns, score thousands of leads, and... Okay, fine. It's a lot of sweat. Unless you have HubSpot's AI-powered marketing tools to help you do all that and more. Get started at HubSpot.com slash marketers. From NJ.com and the Star Ledger, welcome to the Rutgers Rant, your one-stop podcast for the Scarlet Knights. With your hosts, Steve Politi and Rutgers insiders Brian Fonseca and Pat Lenny. Let's start shopping. All right. Welcome back to the rant. I guess we have to talk about it. 42 to 7, Wisconsin loss. Wisconsin win. Ah, we're off to a we're off to a start that befits the game here on the rant. Fellas, I'm, I'm gonna put it this way. And I I I, I was thinking about this, like the right word for this loss. And I've, I've landed on demoralizing. It's not the most embarrassing loss. There's been plenty of those. Not even really the most disappointing loss. I, I guess you could make a case. It's just demoralizing. Like when you go to this game, you think this is going to be a day. They're going to win. They're going to beat a, beat a good program that they haven't beat yet. That's going to prove that they get them to five and one, going to establish them in a Big Ten standing. It's going to mean something for direction. Not only do you not get that, but you get your ass handed to you in a game that changes your perspective on. A the season and B the direction of the program. I mean that that's just kind of that's the kind of loss it was for me. Like I don't feel good about where this thing is headed now. And I get it. It's one game. Greg Shannon's right. You can't look, it happens all over the place. You can't use it as a barometer for everything, but man, <laughs> all the air just came flying out of the balloon. The balloon popped, the air came out, whatever it is, just ab- absolutely deflating. Um because this is a team that felt very much beatable. Rutgers was favored. Half of their roster was injured, seemingly. They had 11 guys on the availability report. And they came in and just absolutely destroyed Rutgers. I mean, we talked all year about how they're not playing Ohio State and Oregon. They should be thankful after watching that game, because if they're losing by 35 to this Wisconsin team, can you imagine what would happen if Oregon came to Piscataway? I just, I mean, and I think this was something that, Greg Shannon likes to talk a lot about how it's a lot easier and better to teach from the win column than the loss column. But I think those two narrow wins over Virginia Tech and Washington helped kind of ease uh, any tension about the real issues on this team that really reared their ugly head between a defense that cannot stop giving up big plays, cannot get to the quarterback, cannot make tackles uh, at the the linebacker level, which, again, you could credit injuries or not, but just – major issues. You got an offensive line that loses one guy and all of a sudden they can't get a push on blocking sleds, let alone opposing defensive lines. You got a, a running back that is no longer the superstar supersonic. I mean, it's impossible to expect Kyle Manungai to continue playing at that level. And now that he hasn't, you have wide receivers that cannot catch the ball. You have a quarterback that is not making their lives any easier and is not playing, accentuating the rest of the team. It's just, there's a lot that went wrong, a lot of reasons to be concerned. And frankly, I don't think I would pull this out at all the season, let alone this early. But fellas, I mean, oh, mash that thing. Oh, that is it's not. Time, you know, I, think. I, I don't. I, I think you need a bigger button, Pat. That's, <laughs> that is pathetic. What kind of button is that? That's, that's like a, I'm at a hotel. The Eldridge. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> the Eldridge exactly. Hotel. I go ding, ding, ding. Oh, can I please have my suite on the upper floors? That's not a panic button, man. I'm it, disappointed. It, it may not be even... big, but it may not be big, but it makes the same sound as all the other ones. Well, now I just oh, messed you broke it. <laughs> You can't well, even use the panic button right. I don't, yeah. I don't even know how to follow this up, but I the thing that stuck out to me the most is that Rutgers has been talking about doing all the little things right for so long, and the fundamentals were so <laughs> glaringly awful, right? So yeah. unprepared. Couldn't substitute effectively. Couldn't catch the ball. Couldn't snap the ball on that field goal. Like everything that you expect – a team that's that that preaches discipline and we put up with the cliches and the and the quotes and the chop the moment do your job because you expect this level of competence and then you see it and it's just when he said walk and chew gum at the same time i, I think it was even worse than that. <laughs> like yeah. they yeah. they couldn't even walk 
Right. Yeah. No, you're so right. There's so many of those things you mentioned. The substitutions. I mean, just clown car. I tried to describe what it was. Just constantly, guys running on and off the field. Oh, here's a defensive tackle trying to cover. I mean, just stuff. You're like, what is going on with that? The drop passes. I mean, and I get it. They're not. They're not all good throws. Some of them were behind the receivers a little bit, but. I mean, look like these guys had never practiced together. It was just it, bad on all levels. And Brian, to your point earlier, and this is what this is what I keep on coming back to because I had a, had a conversation with someone who's like, "Well, you didn't you didn't take the injuries into account," and I'm like, "Well, you know, is this the only program in, in college football that doesn't have backups? Like Washington had injuries. They had backups. Backups won that game for Washington. I mean, I get it. These were important players. Tyree Powell is a huge player. Robert Longer, I get it. But you can't tell me you can't tell me you lose the left guard and that's it." Let's go home. We lost our left guard. We're done. We can't run the ball. We can't block. We can't complete passes. Especially when all we heard about this offseason and and talking to this team over and over again was the depth is so much improved. And what happened at the tail end of last season when Rutgers got worn down by the best teams in the Big Ten that it built, you know, the depth issue was corrected the depth issue may be worse now than it was last year. Right. And you're seeing it in, in real time. Like the, the injuries, it, exactly like you said, it's, it's, it's an easy excuse masking bigger issues. That's mm-hmm. the only way to put it. I think it would be a much more effective excuse if it wasn't against Wisconsin, which again was down 11 guys on its availability report and its backup quarterback looked like the best quarterback Rutgers would have had since Gary Nova or maybe even ever. I mean, he looked great. Um, to be fair to them, it wasn't just the starting left guard. It was also the starting your best cornerback, your best linebacker, your two best linebackers. Um, your, your tight end exits in the first half. Your starting safety exits in the first half. Your best defensive end gets hurt and, and misses you know most of the game. So a lot of these things piled up. But that is no excuse to lose forty-two to seven. It, it's it's not. I think this speaks to two issues: the lack of depth is is absolutely true. The lack of talent. I think this team is very top end heavy as far as talent. And that is very clear when you lose your best players and the drop off is so massive. I mean, Rutgers had as far as the two, four, seven team talent calculator, which calculates how talented this team is as far as these kids recruiting rankings out of high school. Rutgers had the second lowest team talent in the big 10. And not only is the talent not there, the developmental program is not developing the talent that's waiting in the wings and the coaching the coaching is not elevating the level of the talent. You don't have an offensive coordinator that's scheming up these, you know, inferior talent and and being creative and and opening these these plays up. It's they're running the same, you know, two or three run plays. They're running the same two or three pass plays. The players aren't executing it, and it just looks it looks bad. I, w- I was told there's a pipeline, Pat. I was told that they were going to be put on one side. This and now they should be the players should be just flowing out of that pipeline. We should be awash in talent in year five. Honestly, I mean, Greg Shannon, no, it's not where we absolutely. it's not where we have stacked guys up yet in the program. So when we lose somebody, someone's got to step up. Well, when when does that happen? I mean, I get it. It's not it's not 15, you're 15, it, it's your five. I, like, where are the like, where are the guys, where are the players? Where's the backup left guard? I know I'm focusing on one play. Like, I get it. It's not just that, but where well, are the here's, linebackers? Here's, here's a good point to and and you you hammered this point about Christian Dremel, right? A developmental guy that came out of nowhere, a guy like Kyle Manunga, another developmental guy, Holland Pierce. There's there are great examples of guys that have have clearly gone through that pipeline and positioned themselves to be NFL caliber players on this team. There, there's no question about that. Um, they are bringing along some young players, but the the drop off, as Brian was saying, is glaring and. I I just don't know. Like when when you talk about personnel and you, you're everyone, all the receivers are dropping passes. I think the Christian Dremel point that Dremel you kept oh talking God. about was is, is a glaring is a glaring <clears throat> mismanagement of of evaluation, right? It's, it's, it's not thing. it's not just right. usage; it's evaluation because you're saying he's not good enough to be on the field because these players are better than him. But he was your leading receiver last year. Um, I and I get some guys, new guys came in. Chris Long came back. From injury um but it's just it's that that evaluation process is maybe what's lacking the most and it's an in-game coaching thing sure all right you've got now you've got guys who everyone's dropping the pet everyone's dropping every pass like i heard well christian dremel you know he, he got beat out i get it he got beat out in camp all right he the one thing he does two things he does get open and catch the ball you had one situation in this game, and finally he's on the field. He gets open and catches the ball. Design play for him. I get it. Then he disappears. 
doesn't come back until later in the game. He gets open and catches the ball. The second six snaps he played, catches two passes for 50 yards. To me, it's just like, all right, they, they've got a plan. They come in, something goes wrong, something goes haywire. Never adjust to it. Absolutely never adjust to things. The coaching there and the offensive coaching, to me, it's like – the the Kenny, the Kenny Fletcher thing is the other thing. Like it works so great. We had the, oh look at this. Rutgers has finally got a tight end. They're going to run this the same play to Kenny Fletcher against Virginia Tech. Virginia Tech figured it out by the second half. Certainly the next game, Washington had seen that in the film, figured out. We are now four weeks later, right? I mean, like they're still convinced the world sees Kenny Fletcher come in the flat. There's like a linebacker standing there. Kenny Fletcher's doing the squid arm things because he knows he's going to get smacked right away. He gets the ball. He leaves the game with an injury. What? How does Kirk Shiraka think that's going to work? I just think it's just like stuff like that where you're, I mean, I don't know. There just seems like there's a level where you, not only are you not coaching guys up, Brian, you're not, you're, you're not rising to the simple level that you need to be as in a, as a college football coach. Absolutely. S- scoring, going two straight games without scoring a single point in the first three quarters is inexcusable. I don't care who you're playing. Nebraska was good. Wisconsin is not that good defensively. It's certainly not good enough to shut you out for three quarters. It's inexcusable. Uh, to the point about adjustments, last week we ha- we hammered this. First quarter, Kyle Manungai is running all over Nebraska. Nebraska makes an adjustment. No adjustment back from Rutgers. You know, you could, you could make it. It's, it's legal to make adjustments back and try to counter the counter from the other team. Just nothing there. It is malpractice for Christian Dremel to have six snaps in a game where in two catches he gained more yards than the entire rest of the team combined. It, it, it makes no sense to me. There's no justification when a guy – is, is the only one that can catch a 30 yard pass downfield. It, it just doesn't make sense to me. Um, and the same is for the defense. Like I understand they're beat up. And I think the loss of Tyron Powell and Mohamed Ture is so very clear in games like this, where you're, you're, they're just getting shredded. Wisconsin went march down the field on the first drive with such ease that it it's inexcusable, but you're giving up big play after big play. You're not tackling behind the line of scrimmage. You're not getting pressure. The defense that again was supposed to be the backbone of this team does not look like it. It's a significant and, and it's not looking like it for a while too, Brian. It's not like right. it, the injuries weren't the it didn't look like it against Washington. The team was it didn't was look like healthy. it against against Howard, right? Yeah. Right out of the right out of the gate, Howard <laughs> was marching up and down the field on him. And I know the final score ended up being what it was, but Howard was easily moving the ball on this defense that was supposed to be a top twenty five defense. That's mm-hmm. I, I I wrote this yesterday and I I broke down the stats of this all. Rutgers gave up more yardage to Washington and Wisconsin. It's last two home games than than three games last year, Michigan, Ohio State, and Penn State. Wow. That's unbelievable. Yeah. yeah. And, and I, I want to impress that these are issues that we have been talking about for weeks. It's a lot easier to bring these up when coming off of losses, but these were very evident against Washington when they gave up 521 yards. They were very evident in the fourth quarter when they almost completely collapsed against Virginia Tech. They were very evident uh, at points in the Nebraska game. Um, and I think this, now that you don't get a win in a, in a game like this, I think this puts serious concern about where this season is going. I think it's fair to say that the special season is is not going to happen. I, I just, barring a complete turnaround, I, I just, I think you're talking about beating UCLA. I really think this team is still good enough to beat UCLA. Losing to USC. I, I don't think they're good enough to win at USC. Then you have four toss-up games left. Rutgers went two and two in its first four toss-up games. Two wins that, again, barely survived in one, probably shouldn't have won in the other. If if that plays out and they go two and two again in the last four toss-up games, you're talking about a seven and five season that, yes, it's an improvement from last year as far as a win, but given all that we talked about in the preseason, to me, it would feel just as a massive disappointment. You might sign for that no right now. I mean, I'm I'm not I'm not chalked. I have no I don't know who I'm gonna pick yet, but I mean I don't think UCLA is a given. They 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 I get their one and five, but they still were competitive in, in, in four of those games, I think, or five. You know, they're pretty close to it. I mean, if you're banged if you're this banged up and some of those injuries didn't look good, and I don't know, like we don't have the answer. I know everyone wants to know, but Aaron Lewis's injury didn't look good. Sam Brown's injury. I mean, the Big Ten network showed him on crutches limping up the tunnel. Um you know that didn't look good. Like I, we haven't gotten any any sense of, of whether or not Tyree Powell or or longer been going to be back. Like we like we're, they were, I didn't get the sense they're out for the season. But I don't know. Like if, if a certain point where clearly the backups aren't ready. Yeah, and and uh, what, what there's nothing else. I, I just I feel personal responsibility for asking the injury question week after week. <laughs> we're not going to get any answers. 
uh, this week it'll be, well, we'll just wait for the availability report. Um, at, at least he did say that Tyreen Powell got hurt in practice. Right. 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 That, cause that one was a shocker. Uh, he was out on Saturday, uh, pregame. I think we knew longer beams kind of trending back. I mean, he did get on the field last week and couldn't go. So maybe he's a week away regardless. Uh, the injury situation is, is very, very serious. Uh, there, there's no other way to put it, but, like you said earlier in the podcast, teams teams have backups. Teams are prepared for these situations, and the drop off can't be this significant. It's just right. apparent. On, on the offensive line, I think it's very concerning that the guy that comes in for Taj White after he gets down on the first play is Terrence Salami, a walk on who this time last year was probably the seventh string, you know, center. Uh, I think Rutgers had some bad luck in the offensive line recruiting in the twenty one class, where two guys, uh, Joe DeCroche and Jacob Allen both suffered career-ending injuries very early in their career. That's bad luck you can't really plan for. But Dante Chin is a guy who you thought would be the backup left guard when Brian Felter got hurt. He didn't even play, I don't think, outside of like kind of jumbo packages. I just I think Terrence Salami coming in is a bad omen. Uh, Tyreen Powell, just to address that, because I know a couple of people have asked us about this. There was some speculation that he might be sitting out and redshirting. Uh, his father posted on Facebook that he's okay but not playing on Saturday. My interpretation of that is that he is okay as far as it not being a long-term season-ending injury, but he was not okay enough to play on Saturday. That's my interpretation. We will ask Greg Shano again about injuries. If if Pat wants some relief from being the injury guy, I can... You might have to take it this week. I'll take the baton this week, but um, we'll ask for some clarification. This is kind of the rabbit hole that opens up when you don't want to talk about injuries for a competitive advantage, which I do understand. It leaves open for some speculation. I don't think there's anybody else that that is in, in the uh, in the line of fire for any speculation on redshirting because Robert Longerbeam has played five games. He can't redshirt. And a lot of these other guys have all played five games, so they can't redshirt. But I just wanted to address that. Um, and Kenny Fletcher, I didn't realize it at the time during the game when he got hurt, but I watched the replay. It was on that pass where the ball literally went right through his hands. I, I've never seen anything that like, – just went right through. Uh, he gets hit by the defender who was anticipating him to catch it, and it looks like it catches him in the hand or the wrist area, and it, looks, it looked bad, uh, and he looked to be in pain. I don't know how – Bad it is, but I think that's uh, not a good sign. And if even if you lose one or two of these guys for a game or two, I mean that's it's adding on to a, an already big pile. Uh, but even then, even then, even then, they got to beat UCLA. I don't care. Of course, I don't care. Yes. I don't care who's as must I don't care win this, quarterback. You got to beat UCLA. As must win a game as you could possibly have at this point because you're can't right. Lose. Yeah. Can't, can't lose. It's, a must, it's, can't it's not lose. a must win. It's a can't lose. It's can't a can't not, lose. Not, yeah, right. You totally, absolutely, because it would be. Then you're looking at some. Then you're looking at the. Uh, it's the where the, this season could go in the other direction. I still think this is, un, what was it, ninety six percent bowl? We had ninety eight percent. It's yeah. like ninety six point six. Ninety six after Washington win. After, after Washington, the Washington yeah. win, I still think it's a bowl team. But then you're, I mean, you're, 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 you're putting it at risk certainly. Uh, and the thing that this team still has going for it is the schedule. Maryland lost to Northwestern. Um, Minnesota does not like it. They beat USC, but they they're no, they're no world beater. You see, like you see, they beat USC. They beat USC at home, they and they just yeah, barely right. scraped by yeah. UCLA this weekend. Right. Sorry, yeah, yeah, yeah. And Michigan State's not great. I mean, they're yeah. So it, Illinois, it, they're not great. There's not a lot of teams here that really only gave up a hundred points to Purdue. I don't know. It's still you know who else is not great. You know who else is not great. I do. I Wisconsin. Do, I know yes. Wisconsin's not great. They are not great. I think yeah. this result says a lot more about Rutgers than it does Wisconsin. People asked Luke mm-hmm. Fickle if the team turned a corner, and he said that the college football season's like NASCAR. There are a lot of corners. I think he might be confusing it with Formula One because NASCAR is one giant circle. I digress. Um, but I think even he realizes like this is not a sign of Wisconsin you know, turning the corner. I think this is a bad reflection on Rutgers, and if they don't answer the bell against the UCLA – I mean, this peg button, I'm tapping it. I'm going to smash it with the, the hammer that Steve Pikele uses to pound nails because that would be – forget a bowl game. We're talking about a complete reversal in the direction yeah. of this program. Man, just didn't see it coming. And that's that's the first. Let's get into some questions here because we, we got – we're getting some uh, rapnel is the right word. <laughs> Fans are sort of like, hey, hey, you guys are supposed to be the bleeping experts here. What the hell? Brian K friend of the podcast i would like to know from our independent thinkers yes <laughs> guys what did you see and how are you not seeing the wheel the carriage and the driver falling off y'all pick ruggers to win what gives um yeah that's that's a great that's a uh, okay fair and i i guess that was i come i come back to that was the feeling in the stadium 
and just talking to people before the game, everyone very optimistic. And just afterward, I think that's what made it the loss. It was that people were just shocked. They didn't see it coming. And it reminds me, it's funny. This is the, this is, I'm trying to think of a parallel in Rutgers history and going to go back to before you guys were born. Kidding. Going back a long ways, at the, the game at Louisville uh, in 2005, they lost 56 to five to Louisville. Right. Louisville's ranked. I think there was some optimism like this might be a chance to go in there and steal a victory. And I remember I remember talking to Brian Leonard in the locker room when we could still go in the locker room after games. Um, it seems like you talk about years ago. And Brian Leonard's response was like, I thought I thought we were done with games like this. And that's exactly exactly how I felt after this game. I thought we were done with games like this. Yeah, it's the same feeling. That was that was the pr- parallel. The parallel that team rebounded, got to the bowl game. We know what happened to the next year. So if you're looking for reason to be positive, yes, really good. Yeah, I, that that kind of sums it up. But the and, and here's the thing: why there was so much optimism because that second half against Nebraska. Yes, there were a comedy of errors with the drop pass and and just poor execution. But the defense was so good in that second half. And you saw, okay, maybe maybe this is finally the the performance that springboards this defense to play the kind of brand of football that we expected this year. So we came into the season knowing what the strength of this team was, was going to be its defense and ability to run the ball, right? And then slowly that's kind of just fallen apart. Uh, but you saw a great flash of it last week in Nebraska, which gave me optimism that this could be – I, I I don't think Wisconsin's a bad team. I, I think they're very I, like coming in. I thought this was going to be a tough game. I thought Rutgers could still win it, obviously, but uh, I, I didn't I didn't want to undersell Wisconsin. Regardless, uh, the point I'm trying to make is you saw the potential of this team early uh, with the efficient passing when everything's working right at Virginia Tech and Washington, right? Like the the, the complementary football works when it, when you're playing great defense, but when you're not playing great defense, it doesn't work, right? And, and this day and age in college football, how many teams are still trying to play great defense and run the ball? Like Boise, Army, and Navy, right? Like yeah, it's, yeah. it's you, you, you choose your identity and you go from there. And Rutgers has kind of lost that identity, uh, certainly lost it in this last game. There, there's no yeah. question. I had two reasons for – two major reasons for optimism. One, the schedule, which I stand by. The schedule has not – there's not been one single team. If anything, the schedule looks even easier than it looked in the preseason. USC is 3-3. Three and three. Yeah. Wisconsin yeah. is banged up and not good as, – as I should say, not as good as usual. The, the, the sure. schedule looks even easier. And as good as Ohio State and Oregon looked on, on uh, Saturday and Penn State looked at USC, the schedule could have been so much worse. Right, I, I, that that to me is, is it makes this an even bigger disappointment. The second reason for optimism is all of the returning experience. Rutgers, I think, was 14th nationally in returning production, and uh, the return of the major players of the coaching staff, Kirk Shiraka and Joe Harris Simiak, and obviously Greg Schiano. I thought everyone collectively would take a step forward, and combine that with the schedule, Rutgers would take a step forward. What I didn't account for is the fact that Rutgers did not bolster its roster. It kept a lot of the same guys. It did not add to it. It got a quarterback that was a slight upgrade from Gavin Wimsett. It did not add a, a you know good pass rusher. It did not add a dominant wide receiver. It did not add a player that takes this team to the next level. And the coaching staff clearly has not been able to take the players they have now and bring them to the next level. I just can you name me aside from Kyle Manungai, who I thought in the first three or four games looked better than he did last year. Can you think of one player on this roster that has looked better in the first six games of this season than at any point last season? I can't. I, I literally cannot. And that's an indictment, I think, on the coaching staff's development and on their game planning, right? I just, I, I think that to me is why I was optimistic. And I think this game, uh, just like the fan base you said, is a huge wake-up call to me um, that you cannot ignore the screaming bells of the first four games, all the, the signs, right? you can't ignore them anymore. I think Wisconsin give a, a nice, in Portuguese we say, a, a cold bu- bucket of water, just drop the big cold bucket of water on everybody. Everybody's kind of eyes wide open now. And um, I think, I, I agree with Greg Schiano. Probably don't need to overreact, right? I know we are overreacting here a little bit. I, I still think they'll make a bowl game. But, I mean, I, I think it's fair to say, like you said in the beginning, just the most disappointing, disheartening loss of the Greg Shano 2.0 by a very wide margin, I would say. That that cold bucket of water, that might be an expression in other languages, Pat. I don't have to look. I've heard that in, um, what's the language I'm thinking, English? I've never heard anyone say it in English. Like, like as a, as a bucket of water. Okay. I mean, yeah. would you use that in regular regular conversation? 
Uh, I don't know. I got me, yeah, maybe a bucket of water. I don't know. Ice water, a little. Uh, I remember yeah. the ice bucket challenge from years ago. Who, for, uh, who, who right. didn't, who didn't right. do the ice bucket challenge? I was right. saying, I was going to write yeah. it in my film review and I felt dumb, so I deleted it. So you save the good content for the record, Trent. I'm <laughs> sure the fans <laughs> appreciate that. Yes. <laughs> yes, indeed. Brought to you by the Heldridge Hotel to keep this sponsor. All right. Um, some more questions. Play calling was a big topic of conversation from everybody. Um, the fourth and one call is a popular one. On fourth and one, don't give the ball up the middle to the running back when everyone knows the play. Um, everyone's talking about the Fletcher thing that I mentioned. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I don't know. I, 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 the thing I come back with, with all of this is, is just the general sense that Rutgers is playing these games, not to lose a lot. Like you saw, we saw Wisconsin did came out and they, you know, they were really aggressive in this game. And I was impressed throwing the ball down the field, testing the Rutgers secondary. Um, you know, it wasn't just it's handed the ball off running for 200 yards, which of course they also did. Um, it was, you know, some creativity, a lot of things. Rutgers just seemed scared playing, like playing, the, playing a little a lot of fourth and ones, a lot of, okay, we're going to punt now. A lot of, let's see if we win this game 17, 14, when you're down 14, nothing. And before you know it, it's 42, seven. I, I just want to address the fourth and one real quick. So <laughs> it was a big deal in Wisconsin that they, line up and shotgun and run the ball, right? Like losing your identity, right? It was a big story all week leading up to this game. We, we talked to Greg Shiano about his decision, how, why Rutgers won't go under center. What does Wisconsin do with the goal line? Puts in a fullback and runs the ball right up the gut in the eye formation. Jeez, heads were so happy. <laughs> yeah. Was that, was that the play that Rutgers didn't have enough players in the field? Was that when they were completely unprepared for that, Brian? <laughs> That no, was a that different was, uh, touchdown. That was the, the fourth touchdown was when Rutgers was doing one of those yeah. clown car substitutions and right. they just yeah. sat down on the on the field as when the ball snapped. was snapped. Yeah. So the running back has an entire lane to run yeah. into the end zone because it, it looked really easy while I was watching it live. When I looked back, I was like, oh, of course it looked easy. <laughs> Rutgers was, yeah. was moving before the snap. Uh, just, just the... No, so, Rutgers was set yeah, for that goal line. That's yeah. what I come back to, right? Rutgers has been horrible in fourth and one uh, in short yardage situations and they keep yeah. doing the same thing. Yeah. And refusing to change. That's do it that's again. an issue. Here's yeah. what I don't get. In the first game, I'm pretty sure they had like a four, like a fourth and goal at the goal line and they ran the fumble ruski. But before that, they ran another like fourth and one play. I, I just – it feels like they're devolving. I, like I don't yeah. understand why they don't try I, – I, they haven't tried a QB sneak in a few games either. I, I just don't. Yeah, with an athletic I, quarterback. I, mm -hmm. Yeah. Yep. And yep. He showed that athleticism. He, he looked great running the yeah. ball against uh, – it was probably too little too late when they were running tempo in the third quarter. But he looked – Cal McManus looked great running the ball. Well, like, you know what? You know it's coming here, by the way. And I give you guys – I give our insiders and Rutgers sub <laughs> subscribers and rant listeners tremendous credit for the restraint you showed and not asking these questions later. But is it time for the quarterback switch? How good does uh, Shepard – Johnny Shepard look in practice and oh how bad God. does – it have to be for there to be a switch. That's from BK on the Twitter. Uh, it just see uh, this. I thought Greg Shannon missed an opportunity to send a message to his team and maybe spark something by not putting a Johnny Shepard at quarterback after the first possession of the second half. Although this is from Guy and Paramus, he says I am not calling for a quarterback change in capital letters. Um, the offense was list lifeless and the team crowd needed something to get their attention. Um, also begs the question: How far is the gap between the two? wide right the gap is wide let me ask you this when chris long dropped a couple passes why didn't nazir montgomery come in the game to give a spark to the offense yeah yeah when when, when kyle Manunga gets tackled for a loss why don't they bring out um antoine raymond for for a spark well when when, when the left when brian felter got hurt and they put in their backup as we talked many times on this podcast we saw what happened what, yeah. what are we doing, guys? What are, what are we doing? Oh, I know. Come I'm on. just telling not, not, people, you. Not you. Is, not you. Not you. Right. I'm just the message. What are we doing, guys? Come on. Come on. You didn't see it coming a mile away. It is a good question, though, because I am no, curious myself. Not. I No, the question, how far is the gap, is a good question. I am curious myself as to what the other quarterbacks look. They are the future of the program. It, clearly, clearly, Ethan is what he is. He's closer to what everyone in Minnesota told us he was than what we thought he was in the first four games. Not a savior, just a stopgap. Okay, better than better than the previous passer in that he, you know, occasionally throws a ball on target. 
Like that's what we got here. So what? So what is? Is it Johnny Shepard more than a developmental guy? Can he be a starter in the Big Ten? I mean, I I, I know you know they put a lot of eggs in 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 the freshman who's been hurt. I mean, what, it, it, are we looking? At, what is the situation there at that position? I, I would say this: uh, uh, Johnny Shepard did get in the game right and and the final drive and didn't even attempt to pass. Right? Well, of so, course, yeah. At that point, uh, yeah. Um, it's I I think a Johnny Shepard is a is a a guy that in a, an emergency situation will keep keep things moving, right? He can run the ball well, um, but he's he's inaccurate. He reminds me of what I've seen a lot of what you saw last year with Gavin Wimsat, like very athletic, can throw on the run, um, can do things in the run game, but he's not going to elevate this offense to you know a level that it's a, a high flying passing attack. But I think he's a he's not only earned the right to be a good backup quarterback. I, I think he's, he is, would be ready to go, but he's not going to elevate right when you're down three scores, you're not going to put in a Johnny Shepard to come in and be your savior. Johnny Shepard recruiting rankings aren't everything was a low three-star recruit that Rutgers got at the very end of the cycle. Mm-hmm. A Johnny Shepard is not even AJ race. Who was a four-star quarterback. Just be, the quarterback is not the quarterback that's starting is starting for a reason. I know we, I've talked a lot about the coaching staff in this podcast, but I think they can evaluate properly who is the better quarterback. I think Calic Manis is not the answer at quarterback as far as taking this offense to the next level. But I think it's very fa- fair and very safe to say he is much better than a Johnny Shepard is at this point. And barring injury, I don't ex- anticipate him being replaced. So please, please, texters, listeners, fans, subscribers, friends, family, never, ever ask me about the backup quarterback again. Do not, oh, please. Lord, no more. more. Love it. No. <laughs> There's no quarterback controversy. I, I watched Daniel Jones last night. And I had to, like, they should put in cutlets. Give me some more cutlets. I'll be calling tonight. I'm Aaron, Aaron Rodgers. Who's Aaron Rodgers' backup? Give me some Tyrod Taylor tonight. I'm kidding. I'm gonna people talk about a spark. Mood. Talk about putting in the quarterback for a spark. You don't need a spark. You know what you need? You need better play. You need better players. A Johnny Shepard is not a better player than anything Callie Menace. All right, so let's talk about it. Uh, um, the other positions, because I think that it's. I think you might agree. We the receivers. Um, several people wanted to know. Thank God for the Christian Dremel question. Uh, Alex Napoliello, he is a former <laughs> NJ.com um, journalist. We miss him. Uh, great, great, great writer. Uh, you guys mentioned it briefly on the post game video, but why hasn't Christian Dremel played this year more? We've talked about it a little bit. Um, you think he got beat out by uh, Debbie Miller? Was that t- correct? I think we thought it, well, thought it was pretty correct coming into the season. Uh, Miller has not played great. Um, some of the other younger receivers, are we at the point now where we, just, we need to, you know, start giving start giving these guys a chance? Ben Black, start put some, putting some young guys out there more often. What do you think? They put Ben Black on the field, and he's dropped three passes of the seven that were on target, right? he He's just not – I mean, he, yeah. good, he has some good moments, but – I mean, you see what happens when you put true freshmen on the field that aren't ready. I mean, again, it's the same conversation as the quarterback. Maybe you want to give them a chance. Sure. But I'm not convinced they're that much better than the guys that are starting now. The Dremel question is fair, though. I, I Again, I think he should play much more than six snaps a game. I think he should have more than two targets. That was his first target of the season in the sixth game of the season. I, mm-hmm. I th- That doesn't make sense to me. Damian Miller may have beat him out. That's totally fair. He could take the majority of the snaps. I think that's totally fair because I think he is a better wide receiver than Christian Dremel. But the guy should play 10, 15 snaps a game. It just doesn't make sense to me why, why he's not on the field for it, especially after what we saw on Saturday. I think Rutgers also has identified that it wants big physical receivers on the outside. So that's why Ian Strong is a starter, right? He's a guy with size and has shown you some real, real potential. He's a sophomore, right? But he's been a good player, been dinged up. Uh, Chris Long came back, gives you that explosive downfield option, deep threat, kind of similar to Ben Black. And Dremel's a slot guy through and through. That's that's his role. Dimir Miller starts in the slot, and Rutgers has said that Dimir Miller was its best receiver coming into the season. So uh, it's just uh, a lack of playing time for Dremel. Um, other than other than that, I, I, I just I just think. Sure. You can only earn it so much, you know. That, Dremel's, Dremel's arm is hurt from from flag from waving for the fair catch. It's like, right, that, right. That, that that's that that's the real reason here. Something we there. also wrote this past week. Yeah, we did dive on the return game, right? Oh, like, we 
we can't go to that again. We yeah. thought that was we thought that was the big problem going to right. this game, right? Remember that those right. any days right. of uh, right. last, last Monday. All right, um, <laughs> a lot more questions. It's crazy. Uh, it's crazy. What I think one thing you should ask, and if we're talking about what questions to ask Greg Shannon today, I would ask about the defensive substitutions. Not not enough for me to drive forty five minutes down there to do it myself. I am curious. A lot of people are wondering: Can you explain the fiasco with the defensive substitutions? Is that the coaches not knowing the personnel, or the personnel not knowing the formations? Or uh, to me, I think the other explanation perhaps it's um, something to do with the injuries. They have different guys in there who aren't prepared for it. I don't know. I'm out. Yeah, thoughts. Injuries is a fair point. But Aaron Lewis, Aaron Lewis came out. Keontae Hamilton moved over to the defensive end after having played defensive tackle the whole season. That right. might have, you know, jumbled <laughs> some things up. Um, but I, I still don't think that's you know maybe that the first series it's a little confusing. I think afterwards we should be able to. And it, it shouldn't happen three times in one game. It just, it just shouldn't. Right. right. And it also, it also should be noted that Rutgers rotates defensive linemen like that every game, right? Like regardless of how it happened this game, there's always guys running onto the field. What happened this game specifically was it just, whether it was due to injuries, people not knowing their assignments, uh, it, and, and also Wisconsin was playing a hurry up offense that kind of caught them off guard too. And, and imagine this, imagine, imagine if college football didn't put in the rule in place a couple years ago where the referee stands behind the center to give you the opportunity to substitute and run players onto the field. Rutgers would have, seven eight guys on the field for most of those plays because wisconsin was trying to speed them up right, it, it, right so wisconsin caught them off guard the injuries mounted and i think people got confused and the coaches did a bad job of like i feel like explaining the packages uh and substitutions so just a trio a trio of things going against Rutgers. Uh, and it did it did uh, this game did illustrate and, and we had a bunch of again very, very valid question what is the problem with with getting depth on the defensive line about getting getting a defensive line that doesn't get pushed around um i don't know if it's just a bad matchup against a wisconsin that could be part of it but man i mean greg shano has typically gone into he wants to recruit um not the biggest because he can't get him partly but he wants athletic uh, defensive linemen who can you know who aren't just big fat guys up there um they just get pushed around i just it was just again like you watching it is it and the people want to know uh seems like recruiting was going fairly well in that position um is it an nil issue where this is a position of of you know where you need money to get defensive linemen i think that's part of it um i don't, I don't have an answer to that it's it is a big problem though if you were to rank it it's funny someone asked me to rank the problems in the team going into this game i wouldn't have had defensive line in the top five I do now. It's been an issue all season. Yes, the defensive line is the premium position defensively for out of the transfer portal and in recruiting, which is why it's so hard to um, get those caliber players. But it's been a concern to me because that's a big reason why other teams are able to have so many big plays. You're able to have long developing pass plays because of the lack of pass rush and sacks, and you're able to get some big run plays because you're getting gashed at the first level. I mean, Wisconsin had something like six or seven runs to the right side of the defensive line where the running back was untouched. And then once you get to the second level against these inexperienced linebackers, they're much easier to beat in space versus Tyreen Power and Muhammad Ture. And that's just kind of the combination. But it all starts at the first level. And in both run defense and pass defense, the defensive line has not lived up to it. And again, I think like a lot of the, the issues on the team, it's a talent issue. Like Rutgers was not able to get uh, talented defensive linemen to uh, bolster this line. They got Malcolm Ray at defensive tackle, a good backup defensive tackle from Florida State. They didn't get C.J. West who was a premium guy for out of the portal who ended up going to Indiana, who is now six and zero, by the way. Um, so I think, I think it all adds up, but I, I think that's been a concern of mine the whole season. And now with Aaron Lewis out, I mean, I, I just, I'm even more concerned um, if he misses time for a uh, significant time with his injury. I will say, as you pointed out, Steve, the matchup was very bad, right? Wisconsin's for whatever you want to say about what Wisconsin is and changing its identity, those guys up front for Wisconsin were outrageously huge. I thought that was one of the best offensive lines I, I've seen uh, and biggest too. still yeah. like always big. classic, yeah, classic Wisconsin this, yeah. offensive line. Certainly. Yes. The, the uh, rumors of the Wisconsin offensive line greatly. And if someone is going to aggregate this in sports illustrated, there's a good quote <laughs> for you. Rumors of the Wisconsin's offensive demise were greatly exaggerated. Said Steve Politi, host of the, if you guys didn't miss this, I was going to mention this later, but if you guys, if you guys didn't see this, we were, uh, aggregated and that means like somebody came in 
um, took the time to not only listen to this podcast, which you were doing now, but um, typed up our answers to quite our, our, our discussion of the Wisconsin uh, team um, and took our opinions as, as if they, I don't know, like, like meant something and, <laughs> and put them together in a story on Sports Illustrated's website, man. We were aggregated on, on SI.com talking about Wisconsin. I can assure you that the six minutes I spent thinking about these opinions about Wisconsin did not deserve the aggregation treatment. How did you guys feel? You, did you cut that out and show your parents? <laughs> Mom, look, I'm in Sports Illustrated. Oh, yeah, nice, it's like, Pat. yeah, this is it. This is it. I was going to get a frame put it right next to our second place New Jersey Press Association award for the Rutgers rant. I said, we finally made it. We got Gia German on the podcast. What is Gary Smith thinking when he's like, what the hell is this? I just imagine Jack, Jack McCollum looking at this thing. Michael Rosenberg, the great writers in Sports Illustrated. Like, what? I felt like Bill Simmons. And if I had the patience, I would do this and go back and find the episode where a year or two ago, I joked about us one day getting aggregated, and you brushed me off. I know you don't remember this. You brushed me off like, who would possibly aggregate this show? And finally, finally, I have gotten – I was proven right. I knew it would happen one day. I didn't think it would be this, but I knew it would happen. The aggregators have finally popped up. I have been – I'm going to have to be, be more careful about what I say. But it's like a UCLA right now. You know what? UCLA needs to fire – hang on. i got to Google his name, the coach's name. Okay. <laughs> Man, who knew? Who knew? This is good. A hot take. Good to be out there. Big this medium thing. market in LA. Yeah. This Big medium be... market in LA, Wisconsin, man. Aggregating the rant. Huh. Okay. We made it, baby. We made it. All right. A few more things. One, and I, I love this joke. Someone, uh, when I asked for questions, someone said, What is the best restaurant in Detroit? Ouch. So I say, Ouch. Um, the bowl projections didn't really change much. I don't know. What did you guys say? I saw a lot of guaranteed rates. No, you disagree. disagree. Okay. The what ESPN happened? crew has completely shifted it to Detroit. Um, CBS. Where, where, is where was it already? Rate. I thought it was Detroit. No. No, guaranteed rate. I believe um, that was is that the a better. Pick. Is that a higher pick than Detroit? Do you mean to tell I me? I think so. As far as the pecking order, I think Detroit is yeah. the lowest uh, with the pinstripe bowl, the lowest designation for no team. pinstripes higher than Detroit. And well, yeah, it's probably pinstripe. It's like pinstripe is UCLA, and the Detroit bowl is Purdue. <laughs> That's how I would classify it. Is it better? Yes. Is it that much better? No. And Rutgers is almost certainly not going to get the pinstripe bowl again. Um, my Let's God. talk this. Let's talk this realistically. You're not going to pinstripe bowl. Let's say eight and four is what we end up. With. Where is it? Duke's Mayo Bowl. Like, what is the yeah. what is the best case scenario now? We're looking at if this team goes eight and four. Duke Mayo. I think so. All right, that'll right. be fun. Yeah. That's just to see. I if think, yeah, rely Greg text the Mayo Bath. Rely Quest is that is that in the that's doable at eight and four? Rely Quest is isn't Rely Quest the same as the guaranteed rate, or am I confusing them? I think that's yeah. higher. I think that wasn't. I think that's in, that's in Orlando, right? Yeah. Uh, I think you're right. I think you're right. Yes. Yeah, Sorry. So. Apologies. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, Come yeah. On. So I think that's one tier up. Um, my Citrus Bowl is not looking good. No, no. Two. Music City feels like you look. You gotta be. You gotta be nine and three to, to yeah. get that. To, that's a Wisconsin trip to Nashville or some someone like that again. Um, one of the, I guess it's one of those. Yeah, I don't know. It's not, and I guess there's not, to me, there's not much a big difference. There's a huge difference in bowls between eight and four and nine and three. I don't know if it's as big between eight and four and six and six. I guess Duke's Mayo is certainly a better, better bowl, better time, better opponent than guaranteed rate day after Christmas in Phoenix. Um, but I don't know. That that's That's my takeaway on that. What about seven and five? Which is all just as realistic as eight and four. I think you're still looking at the same couple, right? Is that that's still that's still Detroit? Man, man, I, I was I was pinning my nose up at uh, I was PU for a guaranteed rate bowl, but my God, I would take guaranteed rate bowl every day of the week and twice on Sundays Could if I'm not going to Detroit. Good lord! Could it be the three of us in Greek Town, two in the morning at that the world's most depressing casino, playing playing craps? On Christmas, there you go. There's, there's your future. I've just looked at it. The ghosts have come rattling their chains. It's the ghost of Christmas future. And I'm standing at a craps table in Detroit. Ebenezer Scrooge. This is my punishment. I don't know what I did, it. but it was bad. I tell you, it was bad. All right. Anything else? <laughs> 
Please do not aggregate. Please do not aggregate his Ebenezer Scrooge impersonation. I am not. I am not ripping Detroit. Someone else got in trouble for that. I love the city of Detroit. Please, Michigan voters. That's not. I'm just saying. I'm not doing that. It's just I'd rather not be there on Christmas. What? Yes. I agree. <laughs> Save me um, here. Throw, throw, get, throw me get, a Give us a question. Get us a question. I don't get know any more questions left. Do we have uh, questions left? I don't know. Um, yeah, I think that's pretty much it. We've well, covered well, most of the topics. We, we can go on a positive note. Uh, hmm? Rutgers basketball is hosting a scrimmage on Thursday. The season's almost here. It's almost. But I tell you, you want to say positive, but I made the mistake of looking at Ken Palm. I'm like, oh, Ken Palm's sixty. That's not that I, I counted the Big Ten teams ahead of, and it, it turns out that. All of them basically ahead of them in Ken Palm. You're gonna to explain to me why that's not a big deal. I'll get Ken a text Palm. message from Danny yeah, Breslauer yes. about this as well. I get it. Yes. His preseason but. bias is heavily cooked into Ken Palm. The only real ranking start in January, once you have half a season of data to work with, and especially so when the team that returns three guys has five freshmen, which are notoriously difficult to calculate for college basketball, and five transfers. So it looks bad. It looks bad. And combined with Blue Ribbon picking them 15th and some other low choices, I can understand the uh, people reaching for this. I would calm down. Put that away. <laughs> I would calm down. I am interested, though, in hearing your guys' guess. The AP Top 25 comes out today at noon. We're recording this before noon, obviously. Uh, but I would like to see, hear some guesses. Where do you think, or one, do you think Rutgers will be ranked in the preseason Top 25? And two, where would you guess Rutgers will be ranked, if so? No. Right. Dear I, I don't even think receiving votes. This is going to be a team that plays its way in. Yeah, they can't. I, I just do not. I don't foresee anything. I'm shocked. I'm shocked you guys said this. Seriously. Really? Seriously. I, you think I, they're, I think they're going to be, be voted? 24 or 25. Gonna... Really? No. I did see ESPN had them um, 25th in some yep. ranking. That's so interesting. Right. Yeah, but, I don't. I would but be, a team I would that, be surprised. A, team, a brand new team, a, a roster, right? If you're a voter, wouldn't you want to see how that looks before you – anoint them or you're just going to go on the on the fly and say that all right I, would you vote for them in top 25 if you, if you i vote? again yeah. i'm in a very difficult situation here oh, thankfully stop. i don't just vote pretend for... you pretend you live in idaho would you vote for them in the top 25 i, I think it's a compelling uh team with two lottery picks two nba lottery picks that's more talent than in those two guys than a majority of teams in college basketball so mm -hmm. that to me would make it tempting um i would be cautious about it because there have been teams like memphis that collect a ton of talent and don't live up to the hype but i, I to me i think Rutgers would be worth a flyer 24 25 vote because again mm. once you get past in the 20 to 25 range it's essentially a choose your own adventure where you can justify right. Right. about 30 different teams so to me i think Rutgers is worth a flyer and i think a lot of voters around the country who are not you know going through lindy's and, and doing heavy research i think a lot of this is oh my god wait it's sunday the polls do tomorrow let me just type in 25 teams and they'll think, oh, Rutgers has two NBA guys. Let me put Rutgers in. I think that's what's going to happen. Um, do I think they're a top 25 team? I don't. Would I vote them top 25? Maybe. Um, none of this matters until January anyway. Very true. Women's soccer beat Nebraska, lost to Iowa. Um, any, I, other up, any other teams? Well, I, I have the standings up. Um, okay. They are now tied for fourth place in the Big Ten. With okay. Ohio State, they're behind USC and UCLA and Iowa. Oh. Uh, the newcomers, newcomers, yeah. huh? Of big course, game against good at Iowa. That. Yes, the big game against Oops. Iowa was a big, big. They call that a six pointer because you're playing against the direct uh, opponent. They uh, lost, so Iowa gets three points. Rutgers does not, uh, mm -hmm. and they were ahead of Iowa, and they had a chance to go up four points on Iowa instead of two points behind Iowa. Big swing in the Big Ten standings with that mm -hmm. loss, um, and it ends the um, the very long streak of uh, prosperity after Gia German's. Uh, wake yep. up call. That's so. it. Never have another women's soccer player in the pod again. It was a good Come run. On. We got like three weeks. Three weeks. It was a good run. Who's our next athlete good. gonna be? We got any ideas? We need to noodle on this. Wrestling gonna... wrestling uh, media day is tomorrow, so mm -hmm. we can have some content there. There could be some Yaroslav Slavikuski is a great uh, could be a great a great person to have on. Uh, you know, a Harvard go. Harvard guy. Yes. He, you know. Speaks really good English for a guy from Belarus. Uh, he, he would be, he, he has a fascinating story. So I think he might be a good guy. There you go. All right. Put that on the radar. I See will. See if you can pull that one off. Yeah. All right. Anything else? Wrap this up. Well, do you guys want to do a, we're, we're, half, we're at the midpoint of the season. 
right? I guess we could save this for the Wednesday episode. Uh, but I, you know, how do you think the rest of the season's going to go? You guys want to give predictions I now, know. or you want to wait till Wednesday? Let's wait till Wednesday. Give me, give me forty eight hours to think about that. I honestly, this and this is really this. That game has poisoned my brain. I, I it, yeah, like I came after the Nebraska game. I came up I was like ah, it wasn't so bad, and Brian shot me down, slapped me around after for saying that because I was coping. <laughs> yeah, I'm not coping with this one. I'm just not. It's just it's still. I just saw that. And I'm like, woof, ah, yeah, this is gonna be a long dark fall. On that cheery note, <laughs> uh, I uh, yeah, let's sign off. I promise, folks, we will be cheerier. We will be in a better mood Wednesday. Come here to pick the UCLA game. Talk some more Rutgers football. The sky's not completely falling. I looked outside. There's still some blue out there. Hang in there. Hope you enjoyed this show. We'll be back later in the week. Thank you for listening to the Rutgers Rant. To participate in the conversation and receive live updates about the Scarlet Knights directly to your phone, sign up at nj.com slash insider.